Yes. Yes. Tell us your name and your seat number. Q2A439130. Mr. Tuya, my name is Cheryl Renat. I'm chairman of today's parole panel. Seated uh, to my left is Mr. Alvin Roche. To my right is Mr. Pete Freak. Uh, I'll read some identifying information, ask you to confirm it, and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Roche in case it's been assigned to him. I want to recognize that we do have some, uh, some of the victims here that will be speaking in opposition. We'll call on them at the appropriate time to do so. <laughs> So you are Hugh Tuya, DOC number is 439130. You are classified as a first felony offender. Uh, you were sentenced in May 2001. Aggravated burglary. You received a 30-year sentence, forcible rape, 40 years. Aggravated burglary, 30 years. Aggravated oral sexual battery, 20 years. Aggravated burglary, 30. Attempted aggravated rape, 34 years. An aggravated burglary, 30 years. Your total DOC sentence is 74 years. Your parole eligibility dates December 30th, 2022. You don't earn good time. And your full term date is January 1st, 2074. Is that information correct? Yes. Uh, and I also failed to mention we do have a representative from the DA's office who uh, will also be speaking at the appropriate time. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Mr. Roche. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Tuye. How are you? I'm pretty good. Good, Mr. Tuye. I want to do a presentation. And at any time, the information is correct, stop me and correct me, OK? Yes, sir. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, we have you, Tuye, DOC number 439-130. He's 44 years old. He's been incarcerated only 22 and a half years on a 74 year sentence. He's only served 30% of the judge's sentence. He is a first felony offender, but with multiple public convictions for violent and sex offenses and was sentenced to 74 years. Uh, Mr. Tuye. Tell me about your transition plan. Where do you plan to live and where do you plan to work? At this time, I, I don't have nothing to fulfill that obligation. Did drugs or alcohol play any part in the offenses? No, sir. You went on drugs and you were not, you were, were you intoxicated? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, the only program that I see, Mr. Tuye, is uh, the first phase of 100 hours free release. You just completed that, right? Yes, sir. And thank you for a change. And you just completed that in 2021. Am I correct? Yes, sir. I see no other program. Do you have any other program that you completed in your 22 years of incarceration? No, sir. So you do not have, uh, thank you for a change, uh, anger management. You refuse to take anger management, and you're on the waiting list for sex offender treatment. Have you started that risk management program? No, sir. So you're still on the waiting list? Yes, sir. Let me inform you that the DA's office is adamantly opposed to your early release. You also have law enforcement opposition and there's multiple victims submitted a statement saying they're adamantly opposed to any early release. We have 14 violent offenses and six sex offenses on your criminal record. You had a disciplinary write-up as late as 2021 in Feb on February 28th. I'm sorry, February 18, 2021. You had a number five for aggravated disobedience only 15 months ago. That's unacceptable because we're looking for a, a, a consistency 
and follow the rules and regulations. And you had an aggravated disobedience only 15 months ago. Tell me about that right now. I was sitting on my box during count instead of my bed during count time. And you knew better? Yes, sir. Did I see a note somewhere in my paperwork, big note saying that Mr. Tumier didn't want to go before the board? Yes, sir. Is that true? Yes, sir. So tell me why you didn't want to appear today. Because I, I wasn't ready. Okay. And I agree with you. I agree with you. Uh, Warden Ambo, do you have any comments, remarks, or observations? Uh, no, sir. Uh, I see that he's still on the waiting list for sex offender and been on there since 2016. I was trying to find out was he ever awarded the opportunity afforded the opportunity to take sex offender class since he's been here since 2001, but I can't find that anywhere. Yeah, I see where they offered anger management, but he refused to take class. Yes, sir. He refused anger management. Madam Chairman, I do have a recommendation, and I'll give it to you at the appropriate time. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Others who've indicated they'd like to speak, uh, the victim. So I would ask uh, for their comments at this time. I can start. I wanted to be here because I wanted to make sure that you understood the incredible impact that you had on my life, and I'm sure on the life of the other victim on this call. For the last 22 and a half years, I haven't slept a night that I'm not woken up by some noise, terrified that someone's going to be in my house with a gun up my head. I have daughters who I don't allow the freedom that they should have at their normal ages because I'm terrified of someone like you hurting them. And when I add that together with the amount of premeditation and planning that went into finding me and the other victims, stalking us, preparing our homes for your visit, and the callousness with which you attacked us, I don't see it as a crime of opportunity. I don't see it as anger management could resolve that. It was absolutely premeditated and intentional to hurt us. And I agree with you, you are not ready to be free in society because you are a danger to others. You've done enough damage to us as it is. And thank you for uh, the, your courage in, in participating today. Your remarks are certainly very important to the process. Uh, we'd like to hear from whoever wants to go next. I'll go next. Go ahead, Mandy. Okay. Um, this is Mary Porter. Um, I'm a victim as well. Um, I just want to start by saying that I never thought I would have to address the parole board regarding this case because he was justly convicted and sentenced to 74 years without the possibility of parole. And that was a giant relief for me as a victim. And the fact that this has all come back around 22 years later has been a huge source of stress for me. Um, I know that y'all aware, are aware that he broke into the homes of at least three women with the intent to sexually assault them. And by the time he got into my home, um, he had stolen handcuffs and a gun from a police officer, crawled in through my window, pointed a gun in my face, and handcuffed me behind my back and proceeded to rape me vaginally and orally, most of which occurred with a gun pointed at the base of my skull. 
um, the impact of that, not only being sexually assaulted, but assuming you're going to die at the end is huge. It's something that I don't think people can understand unless they've been through it. Um, as far as my personal impact in the very beginning, I quit my job. I left the state. I moved back in with my mother. I didn't sleep by myself for probably six to eight months. I hated when it got dark outside. I couldn't stay alone. And with time, friends, family, faith, I, I've built a great life that I'm super duper proud of, but I am not the same. And because of him, I will never be safe and as carefree as I was before. Um, you know, it, 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 it's altered my life and who I am. I have succeeded. I have done all the things that I hope to do, but I am forever different. And so it's my opinion that he should not be considered for parole. He had multiple victims and got more and more bold, more violent with each one. And I am convinced he will assault another woman if he gets out. Um, so I strongly object to his release. And, to, and to, to, to add to that, he doesn't even seem to be taking it seriously today. I mean, he has no plans. You know, he hadn't taken the appropriate courses. So, uh, again, strongly object. Thank you. All right. Um, Barbara? Oh, I'm sorry. She, the DA's office was trying to join. They have not been able to do so, but the record does reflect strong opposition from the district attorney's office. So I'd like to ask Mr. Tuya, is there a statement you'd like to make other than you want to withdraw from today's proceedings? Uh, I'm, I'm truly sorry for, for what I've done. I'm 100% wrong. It should have never happened. I think we're ready to vote, Mr. Rochelle. Mr. Tunier, based upon a disciplinary write up for uh, aggravated disobedience in 2021, they like a program, no sex offender treatment, history of violence, victim opposition, in opposition to the DA's office. I'm going to recommend we deny your request. Mr. Freeman. Uh, for the same reasons as stated by Mr. Roger, I'll uh, vote to deny you request. All right, and I concur with my colleagues. My vote also is to deny for the reasons that have already been stated uh, in opposition to the express. So today, sorry, your parole's been denied. Good luck to you. Have we not seen a scarier monster, a scarier cockroach than this than this one? I, there's nothing there. There's no human being. There's no, are you kidding me? Like the idea that, you know, the system is broken. It is so broken. These survivors come up here and, and I take my hat off to them because they stood up to this roach. But the idea that he actually says he doesn't want to come to have a parole hearing and they're required my understanding is required by law to have the parole hearing just shows how broken the system is now i did try to find documentation so i wasn't just saying that i believe they are provided to have a parole hearing and i i you know, this is what I was able to find, which are the rules of parole, but I could not find where it stated uh, that, that, that specific, where it addressed that specific scenario. But we have seen, I think now, three parole hearings where we have heard the inmates say that they did not want parole and they were there anyways. And I have seen in the comment section from some of you saying that they are required to, to attend parole. And I'll assume that they are required to attend their parole hearing. And it's hard to, so there's a few things, I guess, are they actually required to? Maybe, I don't know, because did he, 
is it automatic? It kicked in. And then I don't understand which legislation this kicked in because Act um, Act 122, which I don't believe should have kicked in until he has served at least 25 years of his sentence. And so I'm confused about that. I don't know which act now made him eligible for parole. There are so many of them. And then I wasn't aware that it automatically kicked in. I still thought you would have to apply for it. So I'm sorry that I don't have the research and maybe if someone writes it down, I can pin it to the comment section. Um, the next thing I guess I can talk about is Tracy Balbera was going to be there. That was the ADA that they said couldn't get on the Zoom call. And I don't believe the parole board couldn't get on really. She makes it to every single hearing that's important to her. And all of a sudden it was her fault that she couldn't get on. They, they you know, I think that they probably just um, screwed her over in some way. Now, it didn't make a difference uh, but I would have uh, in the outcome, but I would have loved to have heard what she would have had to have said because we don't have any information on this case. And I think it would have meant a lot to the survivors. But as you heard, this guy was a serial offender. There are three that they know of. He stole a gun and handcuffs from a police officer. How does that even happen? And there's just, he's an empty shell. I, 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 he's, a, he's like a lizard humanoid cockroach. There's nothing there. And the idea and these blank steer, it's like, you just, are you kidding me? Uh, the only thing that I think you can give him credit for is the idea that he just didn't even try to manipulate his way out of the herring. He didn't try to, you know, to fake remorse. He didn't. He just said he's not ready. He doesn't want to go to parole. Which I'll, I'll give him brownie points for that, I guess. But. He should. He needs to be in prison for life, and that's where these acts are just totally bizarre. Now, when I was doing the research on finding out if he is required, and I'll put this link in the description, I did find something which was, which was, you know, interesting. These board members. This this solidifies it for me. For anyone who who may have assumed that they were doing this for money, they are not. They are getting paid minimum wage so the chairman of the board shall receive an annual salary not to exceed fifty thousand dollars the vice chairman shall not exceed forty seven thousand dollars so like miss renatza i believe is the chairman um and the regular board members shall not exceed forty four thousand these salaries are like you know Keep in mind that at least for certainly Judge Mirabella um, and Judge Jackson could get a job as a partner at a law firm and make bank just because of who they are and the credibility and s stature it would bring that law firm. And they chose not to do that in their in their golden years, they chose to do this. And that's because they are passionate about making change. And all of these board members really um, are sitting on retirement, I'm sure with their pensions and all different things. They're not, they're not doing this. They could be on other boards making money, every single one of them, I would think. Um, so that was, that was a meaningful takeaway for for me i mean i always assumed that uh but and i and i when i have commented on that but i have seen some of you comment back no that they, they get this salary they get that salary and i never actually saw the numbers and here it is so but we'll move on to the next hearing but again i'm just disgusted by this really monster and the system you would think needs to change if someone doesn't want to have parole and they shouldn't have to take parole i get how that can be problematic uh for a lot of reasons you probably they just don't want to ever put that in the language of the, of the law because of you know oh so why do, doesn't don't they want parole do they are they intentionally living off the taxpayer dollar are they mentally sane should they be in a right so you can't i don't know if they'll anyone will ever put this in writing they want to have a parole board make these decisions but you would think that this would be 
an exception that could be written into the law. It's not like you get a 10 year sentence with parole eligibility after five. This is a sentence where they were meant to be away for life. It was a sentence that was given so the victims wouldn't have to deal with the person. And it's a sentence that this person never had expectations of getting parole. And to then force him to attend parole makes no sense. That shouldn't be a legal hurdle, in my opinion. Right. Let's move to the next hearing. Thank you, Mr. Donaldson. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Donaldson, would you uh, introduce yourself? Tell us your name and your DOC name. Arnold Donaldson, DOC number 176.427. Yes, sir, Mr. Donaldson. My name is Cheryl Lanaza, and seated to my left is Mr. Alvin Roche. To my right is Mr. Keith Freeman, who are your parole family today. Uh, I will read some information into the record, uh, and I'll start the parole process, interview process with you. The case has been assigned to me, and okay. at the very back, we hear from the ward mayor and all the folks who indicated they'd like to speak today. Uh, you'll be allowed to make a statement. Let me acknowledge who is here in support uh, by Zoom. We have your son, Arnold Jr., Richie yes, Donaldson, nephew, uh, both of whom will be speaking. Also, observing but not speaking is Angela Trim, Amber Donaldson, and uh, Taylor Goodnight. Here in opposition is uh, Claude Goodnight and uh, also the victim's daughter. Ms. Dusty, good night, uh, who is here in my position. Um, so you are Arnold G. Donaldson, DOC number is 176-427. You're classified as a first, um, excuse me, a second felony offender. You were sentenced May 28, 2003 for aggravated burglary. You received a 30-year sentence for manslaughter. You received a 40-year sentence consecutive. So that is a total of 70 years. Uh, your parole eligibility date was August 1st, 2021. Your good time is January 10, 2060. And your full term date is July 6, 2071. Uh, is that information correct, Mr. Donaldson? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right. Mr. Donaldson, how old are you? 63. How long have you been in jail? I've been locked up almost 21 years. So you were about 40 years old when the crime occurred? Yes, ma'am. About 40, yes, close around there. So let me ask you this. Uh, you, you've not served half of your studies. As I read the record, you made a plea agreement, didn't you? Did you? Yes, did you yes ma'am. What did you agree to? A manslaughter and aggravated beverage. And you agree in, in the sent you agree to the sentence of 40 and 30 years. Ma'am. Agree to the sentence of 40 and 30 years, 70 years. Yes, ma'am. Okay, tell us what happened. For the crime. Uh, I went to the department and my wife was in bed. Another man and I just lost it. So it was your estranged wife, right? You all were not together. No, ma'am. Been separated for some time. No, ma'am, not long. But, but we were, you know, one living together. Okay. Uh, so, so as I mentioned, you are a second offender, and your priors, even though you had multiple arrests, your priors were for 1970, all of them involved drugs, 1979, possession of perfect Indian, 1980, BWI fires, 1980, possession of marijuana, and possession of intent to distribute quaaludes. In 1981, 1991, and 1994, all DWIs. So you had a substance abuse problem? Yes, ma'am. What what has you done to address that issue? I took substance abuse and a lot of classes to 
helped me deal with all my situations. Yeah, and so so do you could do you still participate programs to address substance abuse? Ma'am. Are you still participating in any program to address your substance abuse issue? No, ma'am, not right now. Yeah. Do you think you're uh a, a, a alcoholic or drug addict? Mm, I was. Alcoholic. So you here? Ma'am. You cured of that yes, disease? Ma yes, ma'am. So I noticed in the record that you um you took you do have a good institutional record, I'll say that for the record. You've been in jail, uh, you said almost 21 years, and you have absolutely no right to be yes, committed on that. Uh, you took a victim awareness and a victim accountability letter training this year. Tell me what you learned from uh, from that. I learned how to uh, my victim awareness and how to how deep and reach the pain and hurt. Of others. And, and in this case, uh, who, who are your victims? Your children? Justy Goodnight, Taylor Goodnight, and Dean Goodnight. And so, what do you think the impact of your actions were? How did, how did that affect them? What you did with their mother, ma'am? Tell me what you think, or how you think, what you did to their mother impacted them. I want to, I want to hear what you thought about that over the years. I know it. I know it hurt a lot. I was out there wrong, and I want to apologize to all of them about all that. You know what uh you got you, did you have your high school diploma at the time no ma'am got that since you've been in jail yes ma'am all right um we have numerous um Expressions of opposition in the record that was provided to us. We have uh, opposition expressed by the DA, by law enforcement, and even some members of your family. Uh, tell us why you believe we should, after the plea agreement that you made, agreeing to a 70 year sentence, you have not served uh, even 50% of that sentence. Why do you believe we should vote favorably for you today? I, I, I didn't quite understand the question. Why do you think, given the nature of your plea deal that you agreed to and that you have not even served half of that time, why do you think we ought to vote to grant you parole today? Can't be get out there to help me deal with my family and make everything right. How you gonna do that? What's your thought about that? How you gonna make everything right? Good. Uh, uh. So what would be let's let's add, let's uh talk about what would be your transition if you were successful, where would you live and how would you support yourself? I would live with my mom and I could got a job with construction company in Rabel. They had sent in paperwork for me to go to work for them. Where would you live? Where would you live? Where would you 
Where does your mother live, in Rival? No, ma'am, she lives in West Monroe. I would be working in Rival, that's the company. What's your job there? What do you do at Ango? I uh, work in the Vets Club as a cook. Are you a veteran? No, ma'am. Or anything else that you and I didn't talk about that you think we ought to know? No, ma'am, I don't care. All right, let me ask uh, Warden Ambo, is there anything you can add? No, ma'am, only that you know, it's been a long time since I've and um, just finished the victim accountability letter. Everything else in this tire is low. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Donaldson, we're going to hear from the people who are here in support, and we'd like to hear from your son, Arnold Jr. Yes, ma'am. There we go. All I right. Um, Go ahead, yes, sir. Y'all can hear me. Okay. Um, you know, I, you know, it's it'd be nice to help get my daddy out, and if he was granted parole, man, we as a family, we're all gonna be there for him and support him with anything and everything that he needs. Uh, he's got a job, he's got a ride, and and. Me, I'm gone all the time. I work out of town, so I, you know, I'll be there for him when I can. But my sisters are local, and uh, and they can be there for him. And, and his mom needs uh, his help, um, and all of his brothers and stuff. Everybody's gonna be there to help him and support him, and, and help him and get him back into our lives after this a uh, long time not being able to. Or be in contact with them. Well, looks like you're at work now, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. Thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. I'm on the job. <laughs> they wouldn't let me off of it. Well, I'm glad you were able to uh, get to the phone and, and participate. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll move on and yes, hear from uh, Richie Donaldson and Matthew. Okay. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Hi. I hope y'all doing okay today. Uh, yeah, Ar Arnold's my uncle, and uh, I'm here to speak today on his behalf. Uh, I'm just here to express my opinions on why I think he should be parole and what we do have planned for him in the future. Uh, I know that you know he he committed a terrible crime that night, and uh, and he should have, and he has been punished for it for over 20 years now. Uh, he has been deeply remorseful. He has uh, shown genuine contrition time and time again through letters that he's written us and conversations that he's had with others and family members. And his actions, they, they did hurt a lot of people. He hurt Nicole's family. He hurt his own and himself. And for over 20 years now, he has regretted what he did. You know, every day and every time that he heard something happening, you know, he's filled with regret. Every time that his kids achieved something, uh, weddings that happened, not being able to be there to give his daughters away, uh, grandkids being born, not being able to be there to raise them, teach them how to fish and stuff that a grandpa should do. He's been filled with bread, birthdays missed, uh, the death of family members, you know, not being able to be there to experience memories and times with those, with them. Uh, not a day has gone by that he, he hasn't thought about the actions of what he has done and how it has affected his family and, and all the other people that, that it affected that day. Uh, and I know now he seeks redemption, you know, and although it can never be attained, I, I think that he deserves a chance because he served 21 years. You know, not only has he served time, he's made time to serve him. You know, he's bettered himself by educating himself. He got his GED. He's participated in multiple classes and teaching programs such as living in balance, moving from a life of addiction to a life of recovery. He's finished both those courses, uh, anger management programs, uh, thinking for a change, Victim Awareness and Victim Accountability Program, as stated earlier. Uh, AA Healthcare Provider Program, in which he was a core curricular instructor in the National Center for Construction, Education, and Research 
where he, he you know, helped teach people level painting, painting level one and two, you know, teaching young men a skill and trade that whenever they get back into society, they can go out and get a job and make a living for themselves. You know, uh, he also found his relationship with God and the Lord while he was in there. And uh, he has references from the guards and warden that he's been a role model, you know, inmates. And uh, that's just some of the ways that he's bettered himself inside there. And, uh, you know, lastly, I just want to speak about the man that I knew. Uh, he wasn't, Arnold wasn't perfect. No one is, you know, but uh, he had his faults. But I can tell you this, he was a father. He always made sure that his kids had a roof over their head. They had food on the table. He always worked. He was a single dad for a long time. And uh, he always worked sometimes two to three different jobs to make sure that they had what they needed. And he was there for friends and family if they ever called upon him. Uh, he paid his taxes, which nowadays is a big thing in this economy to have somebody that wants to get out and work and pay taxes. And uh, But if you guys feel in, in your hearts, you know, that he he's, you know, deserves a chance to get out and all that, we do have a place to live for him waiting on him. He does have a job lined up for him in Rabel. And uh, it just would be a blessing to, to let him out because, to be honest with you, uh, most men in our family, they do not live to be 70 years old. Matter of fact, I don't know any of them that have. And Arnold is 64 now. And I was just thinking that he deserves a chance to get out there and see his kids grow up, to take them fishing, to – teaching life lessons, to eat his mom's cooking one last time because her health is starting to get bad and uh, to start making it right to those people that allow him the opportunity to do it. I just want to thank y'all for your time and, and God bless everybody and hope y'all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for your remarks. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll hear now from um, those in opposition. Mr. Claude, good night. Yes, ma'am. I would like to thank the board for the opportunity to speak with y'all. I just have a few words to say. In the dark early hours of June 24, 2001, Arnold Donaldson, having previously obtained a gun from his brother, broke into my sister's apartment with malice, with murderous intent, shot my sister twice, causing her death. He went there with the sole intent of killing her. This did not happen in a heated moment of emotion. He was cold and callous, surprising my sister with his murderous plan. With no regard for the sanctity of life, with no compassion or care for her children, or the pain and devastation that this premeditated act of selfish hate caused. The pain that he has caused will last a lifetime. <clears throat> he has robbed my sister of her life. He robbed her children of their mother. He robbed my parents of their only daughter. He robbed me of my only sibling. This horrible act perpetrated by Arnold Donaldson by Louisiana statutes was second degree murder which at the time carried life without the possibility of parole. He asked for a plea of manslaughter with the maximum sentence of manslaughter, knowing that he had to serve two thirds of that sentence before being eligible for parole. But now 20 years later, he wants clemency. I asked, where was my sister's clemency? <clears throat> where was the clemency for my mother, my dad, my nieces, my nephew? Where was my clemency? He asked for the years of the manslaughter charge, which I was under the impression was 85 years. That's what the DA told us at the time. I see no reason to give him clemency now after only 20 years. I say let him be held accountable for the sentence that he asked for to the plea deal that he's already made. I understand that Arnold has served 20 years in prison, but during that 20 years, he has been allowed the opportunity to speak with his children, his family, to make friends, to have relationships none of which can my sister do. Her body is in a dark, lonely grave to this very day. The only comfort through all of this is to know that the man that murdered my sister is, is in prison. It's of little comfort, but it is a comfort. So I ask the board for mercy. Please have mercy on me and my family and deny Arnold Donaldson parole because the pain that he caused will never go away. I hear his family talk about he's missed this and he's missed that, but he has been, he's been made aware of his children, of his grandchildren, being able to see them and have contact with them. 
My sister has never met her grandchildren. She didn't get to see her children grow up, graduate high school. She has missed everything. And there's no giving that back. There's nothing that he can do or say to erase the fact that he's, that he not only took her life and took everything that she had, but everything that she was going to have. There's, there's no way that 20 years can make atonement for the pain and the devastation and the loss that my family has suffered and for the things that was robbed from my sister. Thank you. Thank you, uh, your remarks are important to the process. Thank you for participating. And I don't know, Ms. Dusty, if you, if you uh, wanted to say anything, we do have a lengthy letter from you. Um, you're on mute. I do apologize. Yes, ma'am. I do want to make a brief statement. Um, I know I do. I am aware that I did send in a letter um, ahead of time. Go ahead. We'd like to hear what you have to say. Um, so I'm Dusty, I'm Nicole's daughter, um, adopted daughter of Arnold's. I want to start off by saying. That I'm forgiven, Arnold. But sorry. Forgiveness and justice are two very different things. On June 24th, he broke into my mom's home and he took her life. He was supposed to spend 85% of the uh, those years in jail that he was he agreed to. My family and I would have never agreed to this plea deal being offered when the district attorney met with us had we known that Arnold would later be able to apply for parole before the agreed time. I'm sorry. Um, so Arnold not only murdered my mother in cold blood, but it was calculated. For justice to be served, he needs to spend the rest of his life behind bars. If parole were to be given, it would send, send and set a precedence that anyone could commit murder, spend 20 years in jail, and then give him freedom. My mother doesn't get a second chance. My mom was an amazing person. So I just want to humbly ask that you deny Arnold's parole, and it's not out of malice or unforgiveness, but justice. For my mom and my family. I want to thank you for your courage to, uh, to be here today and, and uh, for your remarks. It's very important. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we're going to ask Mr. Donaldson is there a statement you'd like to make to us before we vote? I just want to say I'm sorry for what I've done and all on everything. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I think we're prepared to vote, and you're, uh, as I'll be voting first, your case was assigned to me. Yeah, Mr. Donaldson, I've acknowledged that you have a, a good institutional record. You have taken some good, good programs, um, but I also have to, to hear what was said today. Yes, ma'am. Um, from uh, the victim's family. Um, we also have in the record. Um, and I think I mentioned it to you, that there's uh, opposition that's been expressed by law enforcement, by the prosecutor. Um, so, you know, I think that today's not the day for you. My vote today, because of the opposition that's been expressed, because of the plea agreement that you made also, my vote today is to deny your parole. Um, you'll have an opportunity to reapply again for today. Not today. Um, Mr. Freeman. Okay, uh, first off, I want to thank everyone that showed up. Um, I know it's very hard for the victims to get up there and talk and rehash everything that they've gone through. Um, and I do want to commend you on your prison record, uh, Mr. Arnold. You're doing a great job. But uh, 20 years, 21 years for basically murder. 
I mean, you, you took the plea bargain instead. Uh, I just don't think the day to the day either, and I vote for the night. Mr. Rochelle. Um, Mr. Donaldson, I've been in a, I'm in agreement with my colleagues, but I want to mention one thing before I give my vote. Mr. Nasa asked you whether or not you are a drug alcohol in a drug addict. And you said no. You have a problem and you need to solve it because you are an alcoholic and you are a drug addict. You need to get it with classification out of one and see if you can get a long term substance use. Uh, treatment because you have a history of DWI, alcohol, drugs. And you're not cured. You're never cured. You continuously treat that ailment, a sickness. That's just some advice. Uh, my, my vote is to you deny your request. All right, Mr. Donaldson, today your uh, parole's been denied. Good luck, sir. Thank you, ma'am. So, unfortunately, we don't have any information on this crime. He, you know, he took a plea deal. He didn't appeal the sentence on the plea deal. So, we don't have the appeal and not even the newspaper articles. Uh, it's some, sometimes cases are hard to find any information for some reason, but there's a few things that I guess I'll just talk off of my perception of this hearing. And it felt like he actually was remorseful, right? It, it didn't feel fake. It was felt very different than, than many of the other hearings that we've heard, um, but what I didn't appreciate, and which was kind of, in my opinion, still red flags, was he told Miss Renatza, I want to get out and make everything better. And Miss Renatza even caught on to that, and she asked him, make everything better? What do you mean by that? And that's like, you know, 20 years later, you, you, dude, you're never going to make everything better. You'll never, it's not happening. And it's, uh, it's, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's so sad. It just splits up the family. You have a son that's four, you have a stepdaughter that's against and, and his other daughters that weren't, I don't believe were there, which I assume means that they're against. And if you have children that are against, even asking to get paroled seems to me to be some type of red flag, right? It's, uh, but then I know that's a tough one. If you have your son that wants you out, then how do you pick and choose? Another huge red flag for me, which is just really, it's just hard to wrap my mind around is the idea that he starts off the hearing by saying, when they said, how did it happen? He said, well, I, I, I saw my wife with another man and you weren't married. I mean, you might've been technically married, but you were separated. You were separated for a long time. And as, as her brother pointed out, he snuck into the house. It was premeditated. You borrowed a weapon. So don't go into the hearing saying something that in reality is, is dragging your wife, your victim, your wife, there I just did it, is dragging your victim, I know it was technically, but that's through the mud. I found her with another man. Are you kidding me? Let's play it back just for good, uh, I don't know, whatever the word is looking for. Okay, tell us what happened. The crime. Uh, I went to the apartment and 
my wife was in bed with another man and I just lost it. It was your estranged wife, right? You all were not together. No, ma'am. Been separated for some time. No, ma'am, not long. But we, we were, you know, one living together. Okay. Well, there you have it. Uh, in my opinion, you just, that's it. It ruins the entire interview. Maybe there are, it, it, you, at your parole hearing, 20 years later, you tell the parole board that you came home and found your wife with another man and you lost it. What is wrong with you? You were estranged. You didn't live together. Yes, she was dating other people. We find out the truth. You went there premeditated. And it's like without that, that if he had somehow, I guess you can never admit it, right? You can never say you can't just get out after 20 years. You take a, you take your wife, the mother of your children's life. There is something wrong with you, sir. There is something very wrong with you. And it's, uh, you know, who knows how it is. It seems like he does have some type of remorse, but it might just be remorse for himself when he cries or talks about his children, or that could be remorse about him. Yeah, right, himself. But he probably doesn't care that he ended her life. Like, you just don't feel that. How can you say that? You just, the guy's dangerous. Uh, and you got to have true accountability. You got, he has to admit that, that what he did, he has to admit that he's a monster, that he's a self-centered, I don't know, self-centered, so he can't even start saying what it means. He's just a monster. You took the mom, you took the mother away from your own kids. What is, what, because you're jealous? You can't handle jealousy. It's scary. There are certain people that really, you know, someday maybe he'll get out when he's served another 10 years or something. But it'd be scary. I don't know how you can ever trust someone that can do something like that. This was not a, uh, this was not crime of passion this was premeditated as her brother pointed out but we can move to the next hearing all right we are ready to proceed with mr mingo is that you mr mingo now i have to unmute your microphone hey would you introduce yourself tell us your name and your doc number Melvin Mingo, 367430. All right, uh, Mr. Mingo, my name is Cheryl Linotsa. I'm on the panel this morning. To my left is Mr. Alvin Roche. To my right is Mr. Keith Freeman. I'm going to read some information into the record as you confirm that information. And then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Freeman. The case has been assigned to him. Now, you are represented by counsel this morning. Would you, uh, I'm going to ask your counsel to introduce herself for the record. Good morning, Ms. Renata. Jasmine Cole with the Louisiana Parole Project, standing with uh, standing on behalf of Melvin Mingo, and with the board's permission, I would like to make a statement at the end. All right, thank you. And I believe that we have some uh, other folks who are here in support. We have the Parole Project uh, and some family members, Sierra Austin, your cousin, and Ashton McGee, your brother, all of whom will be speaking on your behalf. And I believe we also have uh, opposition there in the room with you at Angola, and we'll call on him at the appropriate time as well to hear his remarks. So you are Melvin Mingo. You're classified as a first felony offender. Um, you were sentenced August 19, 1996 to life for a second degree murder and assumption marriage. Assumption marriage, excuse me. Your parole eligibility date was August 1st, 2017. You don't earn good time. Uh, Mr. Mingo, is that your understanding? Is that information yes, correct? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Could you answer Mr. Freeman's question, please? Okay, Mr. Mingo. Uh, how old are you currently? 44. And how long have you served on this Senate? 27 and a half years. 
So how old were you when you committed this crime? 16. Um, tell me a little bit about what happened that day. Uh, I understand y'all went down there to rob someone. Brought a yes, pretty sir. good gang too, and then uh, looks like y'all ran into a pretty good gang too. So you tell me what happened. Exactly what happened that day. Well, two of my codees met two of two other guys who came on my codees involving with this crime. They came up with the idea to rob a guy from Ascension Paris, specifically Darryl, Louisiana, out of some drugs and money. Um, it was brought to my attention by one of my codees. I, I agreed to go with him as a lookout guy. When we got down there. One of my codees said he had to use the bathroom. So we stopped the car. My codee got out the car. And when he got out the car, we drove around the corner to drop me off where they wanted me to be in position there to be the lookout. But I'm standing there. I seen two of my codees coming around the corner with Mr. Ronald Williams. Then I seen Mr. Charles Owens running towards them at a fast pace with his hand under his shirt. And in that moment, I, I, I panicked and I ran up on Mr. Charles Owens with a gun told him don't move, seen some other guys coming in our direction. So I took Mr. Charles and brought him outside the house. While I'm standing there with him, we heard a gunshot go off. And I think one of my codees came over there trying to see where I was at. And when he discovered I was on side the house with Mr. Charles Owens, he called my name so when I looked back. That's when Mr. Charles grabbed a gun. So a struggle went off between us with the gun. And when the gun went off, I panicked, broke out running, shooting scared, trying to make it back to the car. When we got around the corner, I was scared, just frantically shooting the gun, trying to get back home safe. Uh, so this crime was, was uh, was drug related. What kind of drugs were you using at that time? What kind of drug I was using? Mm -hmm. I was on the smoking marijuana at the time. Are you doing smoking marijuana? Had you drank anything that day? No, sir. You smoked marijuana? Yes, sir. Okay. Have you received any treatment while you've been in prison for your marijuana? Yes, sir. I attend to substance abuse. And do you think you have a drug or alcohol problem? At the time, I didn't think that I had one, but when I became knowledgeable over the years, I recognized that I did. Um, so at what time did you realize you had shot the, the victim? At the time, I never, I didn't notice that I, I realized that I shot him at all. When we struggled over the gun and it went off, I just broke out running. I never looked. I never noticed he was shot or anything. I just, when I got control of the gun, I broke out running and just with the shooting the other direction, just trying to make it back to the What kind of gun did you have? Assault rifle. Okay, um, okay, you've been arrested, I think, what, about 12 times, most of them gun charges? I can't recall, this is a juvenile. But you were arrested for gun charges as a juvenile? Yes, sir. Okay. What, what, what do you do uh, at Angola? What's your job? I work in the security office as an office clerk. I see you uh, box for 19 years on the uh, boxing team. Yes, sir. Did you have an uh, anger problem growing up? I did. 
Okay, did uh, you take some classes at Angola to try to deal with that angle problem? Yes, sir, I attended angle management. Okay, you also took cage rage? Yes, sir. You got your GED while you've been in prison? Yes, sir, I have my GED, and I also have a, a certification in pesticide. I passed a pesticide exam for certification for private and commercial. You ever taken any victim awareness classes? Yes, sir. I took a victim awareness and I took the accountability letter writing class also. So you've taken a number of classes. I see you with Malachi Dad. Uh, how do you like that program? It, it was it was it was enlightening. Um also thinking for a change. Um a hundred hours pre-release. Um I took a, a chemical dependency class. Uh, also helped me understand about the, the triggers of drugs and um uh, I took a cultivating compassion class also. So what what is gonna be your transition plan when you well, get out? I boxed for 18 years. So I became good with my hands over the years and I'm a fast learner, but my passion is is to take what I learned through boxing, how it disciplined me over the years. And I want to use that because I have grandkids and I, I want to make sure that they don't make the decision that I made. And I want to dedicate my life to not only them, but using my life as well and my skills to help others because I can actually honestly say that boxing actually saved my life in prison. And I know the discipline of it. I know not only the skill set of the physical, but the mental aspect of it as well, the discipline part. And I want to use that to help others as well that may be struggling in their life. So, uh, what about AA and NA? You gonna attend any of that when you get out of prison? I would like to. All right, where are you gonna live? With my daughter. Uh, how are you gonna make money? I mean, I understand the boxing and working with your grandkids and all of that, but how are you gonna make make a living? What can, what can you do? I have a friend by the name Corona. She have her own construction company. She's willing mm -hmm. to hire me up if I'm granted relief. I also have a friend that works with um HVAC um, company in Baton Rouge. I have a twin brother that's been working in plants around the state for the last 15 years. So. I'm more than sure they will be willing to hire me up if I'm granted relief. So you had your same job in Angola for the last 10 years, right? Yes, sir. Correct. Okay, so you must be pretty good at it, huh? <laughs> yes, sir. I see you have no mental health problems, your risk is low. You have a good disciplinary record. You've only had six, seven disciplinary write-ups, and the last one was in 2010. Uh, gave a guard some money to go get you some gin? Yes, sir. So you, you, are, you did drink, I and mean, you are probably borderline alcoholic. I'm guessing right. No, sir. You don't, you don't think you have a problem with me? I admit I had a problem at the time in dealing with that incident. I, I did admit to the warden when I spoke to him about it that I did get a go of the money for the alcohol. When he came on the investigation forward, the warden came and spoke to me about it. It was put on investigation. My trustee status was suspended. I was suspended for boxing for 60 days and upon the investigation, I was reinstated after 60 days with my trustee status and I was reinstated to box again. Why should I take a chance on you, Mr. Mingo? Come on, convince Mr. Freeman that uh, I should take a chance on the man I'm looking at today. What's the difference from that 16 year old that picked up the salt rifle and might have not intended on shooting nobody, but I believe y'all fired 
tons of rounds going to the revenue points. That was a pretty good gun battle out there. Well, the difference is I was 16 years old. I can honestly admit I was a kid uh, operating from a position of angle, no sense of direction. Um, poor, you know, guidance as, as a child, but I'm 44 years old today. I, I have kids of my own. I have grandkids. Um, I'm a man that operates from a position of love, always looking to make, you know, meaningful and healthy relationships. And I know that what I done been through in life in prison, what my mentor done taught me, my spiritual advisor, the people I done became friends with, I know I'm a man today that can get out there and, and, and do better and make a difference in people's lives. And I know I won't never put myself in a position like this again because I have been down this path before. I know how dark and lonely it is. And this is not, that's not who I want to be no more. The person I am today is the person that I want to be. I'm, I'm happy with that. I, I, I found a, a nice relationship with, with meaningful people. I have a beautiful relationship, personal relationship with God, my family, and, and that's how I want to operate from, from this day forward. Okay. All right. Um, you know, you have opposition from the, the sheriff and local law enforcement. Um, you also have uh, opposition from the family. Um, and you have some support from your family. So um, I'll be ready to make my decision when it's my time. Okay. Mr. Roche, I have some questions. Good morning, Mr. Mingo. How are you doing, Mr. Roche? It's fine. Mr. Mingo, it's August 1996. You're 16 years old. Where do you get an assault weapon from? August of 1996. That's the day that you were arrested. You were 16 years old and you had an assault weapon. Where did you get that weapon from? We bought it from the streets. Thank you, sir. You, um, Mr. Mingo, you mentioned you, you're, if you were successful, your plan would be to live with your daughter. Yes, ma'am, but I, I, I plan on going through the parole project first because they have a program that I like to be involved with over there. And after- What's your she, daughter? She lives in Addis, Louisiana. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Warden, Amber, is there anything you can add? Uh, everything that he said is, uh, is true. Um, he's also one of our trustees that we can uh, rely on for the, for, to do any project that we have to do. If a hurricane comes or a flood comes, he's one of the first ones to do sandbagging and stuff. So he has been a model uh, offender since that last report in 2010. Thank you. Um, we'd like to hear from the parole project now, Mr. Hundley. Andrew Hundley with Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, Speaking before the board today uh, to inform you that uh, Melvin is a client of our uh, reentry program. If he should be released, uh, he will imme immediately enter our intensive reintegration program. As this board's aware, we've had around 100 people like Melvin who were convicted uh, and given life sentences as children, served decades, come home. Uh, go through our program and remain a part of our case management system and go on to live successful lives. Um, during his time with us, he will receive a uh, mental health and substance abuse evaluation from our staff social worker. Uh, he will also take part uh, in our training uh, that, where he will learn vital skills such as social norms, uh, credit building, financial management, uh, and how to deal with the, the stressors and the things that he will encounter that he hasn't had to encounter because he's been incarcerated so long. Uh, however, our program has a very high success rate, 
and were confident based on uh, his record of success during his incarceration uh, uh, that he will do well when he comes home uh, and he will remain in our program until he finishes that first phase. And even after he finishes and, and moves uh, to Addis, uh, he will continue to be on our case management roster for a minimum of one year where, where he will have uh, continued contact and check-ins and support uh, with me members of our staff. Thank you. And we'll hear from your family. Can we hear from Ms. Sierra Austin? Hello, I'm Sierra Austin. Melvin Mingo is my cousin. And my the, I have seen a tremendous change in Melvin over the years of his incarceration. <laughs> Our relationship has always been super close and um, we come from a tight knit family and we're more like siblings than we are cousins. And I would definitely agree with him with him going in as a 16 year old and now being an adult or whatever. I've seen a tremendous change as far as his mindset, the way he speaks, the way he have conversations. So I, I am very, I, I would be willing to put my life on the line to know that I've seen a change to where if the board grants his parole, that that route he once took, he will not take. And he has my full support in whatever is needed. Thank you. We appreciate your remarks this morning. Mr. McGee. Yes, ma'am. My name is Ashton McGee. Melvin is my older brother. Um, and I can um, say over the years, like we've kind of kept in constant communication with each other. And it's been um, it's been very encouraging to see his growth, his maturity, um, to see the level of accountability in which he lives with. And that's one of the things that uh, when he and I speak, um, he's always very upbeat, very very positive about his situation and identifying those things and owning that um, that accountability for uh, for his actions and then for the growth that he's experienced over the past um, years of his incarceration. So for me as his brother, um, I've always taken that to heart. I've always um, even used some of the stuff that he and I talk about when I'm mentoring young kids, whenever I'm um, even in my ministry, um, encouraging people to have a certain level of accountability because those things are going to progress you into changing, progress you into becoming a better person, um, someone who's more reliable um, and someone that can be um, of a good resource to other people as you are transparent through your progressions and the things that you've been experienced and encountered in your life. And that's one of the things that I that I pride myself on um, as his brother, because I can always say that even when I was working in juvenile detention, that I would use um, his life experience as an example of transparency and positivity um, to let those young men know that this isn't a this isn't a, a final a final destination for you that there is a, an opportunity for you to become a better person for you to become a, a resource and a source for other people who have uh, made those type of life decisions but through accountability um through change and owning that owning up to those situations um is something that i've i've been very proud as his brother to see him um develop embrace and um just just possess over the last few years his character and his integrity in those situations have been very very vital in his growth all right, thank you, sir. Um, and I, so now uh, we'll hear from the opposition. Is the district attorney on Angola? Yes, I am. Would we like to hear from Mr. Babin? So we, uh, Mr. Mingo, we, there we go. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Morning. Chairman Robson, members of the board, um, I rise in opposition to this parole. Um, I want to get the record straight from some things that I heard first. Um, number one, I just heard that he owns this and has taken responsibility, but the set of facts that he gave you is not the same set of facts that he gave the police in a statement with his, with his mother 27 years ago. Maybe time has taken his uh, its toll on his memory 
but he told you he got out of that car as a lookout. Well, he exited that vehicle with a 30 caliber assault rifle. That's that's a hell of a position for a, a lookout to be in. He also told you that Charles Owens was in a struggle and during the struggle, some shots were fired. That's not exactly what happened. He was in a place of concealment. Charles Owens was going towards where this gunfight was with Williams. He stepped out from cover. He held that 30 caliber rifle to Mr. Charles Owens and said, get down. Mr. Charles Owens got down. Mr. Charles Owens was next to a house that was on pillars. And what this defendant told police at that time was that I told him to quit wiggling and don't go into that house. And he kept wiggling. So I shot him. And he shot him through the chest. One 30 caliber round through the chest. I know in today's world, victims are just an inconvenience, but not to me and not to these. When he shot that kid underneath that house, his father had to help him drag his, his son's body with his chest blown out from under that house and assist. The first responders who responded to give aid. His family has given you their opinion. Some of them could not be located. I couldn't locate them myself. I think probation and parole, the officers do a good job of finding folks. But every person that was contacted objects to his release. Mr. Owen's father never got over this event, ever, ever. Never got, never got over the loss of his son. Never got over the loss of his son. And he died a short time later. Family attributes that to the loss of his son and the trauma that he went through. His stolen brothers and sisters live with this every day. They still live with this every day. He may have gotten his life together and he might be this and he might be that, but they, they never have a chance. They, they never have a chance. We don't have things like the parole project or the innocence project or whatever project. All we have is victims and me. That's it. But I drove two hours today to tell you that I object, the sheriff objects, law enforcement down there objects, and the victims object to what was done. And just to say, never mind, I'll do better, is woefully inadequate. Whenever this individual was questioned, he gave a statement. And in that statement, he told, with his mother present, he was a minor at the time, he was 16, his mother was present. And he gave a pretty clear account of why they were there. This wasn't a situation where he was there to, because he had to be. This wasn't there because he was there, because his mother brought him there. This wasn't, the reason he was there was to commit an armed robbery. And as this went down, they met with resistance. So I strongly ask you to look at the facts. I ask you to look at those victim statements. And um, I drove down here, up here today, um, just to tell you that what our position is, what our victim's position is, and that we have proposed any early release. I appreciate your time. Chairman Renat, it's good to see you again, the other two gentlemen. Um, it's, it's been a long time. Thank you for having me. And I apologize for driving to Angola. My letter said it was going to be conducted in Angola. And I guess I'm showing my age because most parole hearings that I was a part of, you guys sat on bunk uh, at a, on a panel and we all appeared. Um, so if I procedurally down wrong, that's what my letter said was, was going to be here. So I showed up here. Um, if I did it, I'll do whatever I had to do to make my point known to you. And thank you. We do appreciate your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to take your chair. That's okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Mika, is there a statement you would like to make to the panel before we turn it over to your counsel? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to take this time to apologize to the Owens family, the community that my crime was committed in, and 
over the years, I come to realize that this is a stain on my life that I never be able to take away. This is something that I I never be able to undo. And regardless of what accolades I may reach in life, whatever success or whatever it may be, it still will never be enough to to get over the fact of knowing how much damage and pain I caused to the Owens family with taking their loved one's life. And I and I I couldn't possibly imagine what I put them through over the years. And just knowing the person I am the day and, and, and hearing just how much damage I caused over the years and, and, the, and the longevity of it is tears me apart because I know that's that's not the person I am today despite being that lost kid at that time. And I just like to take this time to, to just apologize for all the damage and pain I caused them over the years. All right, thank you, Sarah. Miss Miss uh, Cole. Good morning. I would just like to remind the board that Melvin committed this offense when he was 16 years old. He was very impressionable, susceptible to peer pressure. And it goes a little bit deeper than that because he was searching for this familiar bond that he didn't have his entire life. His father was physically present and his mother was emotionally absent. I'm sorry, his father was uh, physically absent and his mother was emotionally absent. And ultimately he settled for a bond with his friends that led him down the wrong path. But for the last 27 years, Melvin has spent that time well. He has a, had a bad experience that has yielded great results because prison has put him in a place where he has flourished and he has matured into the man that he is today. Melvin has always looked to older men, but this time they didn't let him down. His mentors and spiritual advisors held him accountable for his actions, and they encouraged him to join church and be involved. His programming gave him a new perspective on life and taught him to respect himself and others, how to manage his anger, and how his actions have affected others. He has educated himself, and even though he struggled with getting his GED, he had that champion spirit in him and he kept pushing and he was disciplined until he, until he, and he didn't stop until he got his GD. His job experiences have instilled in him discipline, responsibility and work ethic. He's currently in, uh, involved in, it, in a job designed to be at a, a security office where he's been for the last 10 years. And he, as Warden Ambo stated, he's a model citizen and he, a model inmate and he regularly volunteers when he's needed. And most importantly, his record reflects this progress that, towards his rehabilitation. Most young men, when they come to prison as teens, they have a hard time adjusting. And that usually reflects in their disciplinary reports. But Melvin has quite remarkably only had seven write-ups in 27 years. And he's also been a trustee for the last 14 years, which is almost unheard of for a juvenile lifer. He has a great reentry plan where he'll be living with his daughter in a new city where he can have a fresh start. He has a uh, great work experiences and he has a, he's great with his hands so that he will have a great, he has no issue showcasing his workmanship once he's released. He wants to also give back to his community. He understands that his actions were done when he was a child and he wants to reach out to at-risk at youth to share his experience and hoping that they can get on a better track. And he also wants to use his boxing experiences to raise awareness for alternative outlets. So in closing, Melvin has literally grown up in prison. He's done everything to rehabilitate himself. Age, time, and programming have matured him into the man that comes before you today. Um, in his letter, Captain Pierre stated that Melvin has grown from being a misguided juvenile to an adult with solid morals, principles, and ambitions to better himself. Major William Smith similarly stated that he does not foresee a situation where Melvin will ever end up on the wrong side of law. And these are people who know him. They've known him for the last 12, 10 years and they've worked in an environment where they can recognize whether a person will reoffend. And they have confidence that Melvin will do great once he is released. Melvin has proven that he's done the work and he now requests that this board recognizes his accomplishments for over the last 27 years and grant him release under any conditions deemed necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. So that concludes our uh proceedings and we are prepared to vote. We'll start with Mr. Freeman. 
Okay, Mr. Mingo, you know, you're still a very young man, you're 44 years old. Um, you committed this offense at 16 and a half, which I, I know growing up in prison from 16 had to be very tough on you. And uh, I, I really do appreciate the accomplishment you've made. I think that you are very close to be ready to be granted parole, probably in the next hearing or so. But at this time, I still think uh, a murder of 27 years just didn't quite enough, so I'm going to deny. Mr. Mingo. Yes, sir. You are a Miller case. And when the Supreme Court and handed down its decision, and when Louisiana had it, in the, city, in the Montgomery case, it sort of specified what I needed to look for. I needed to look for full rehabilitation and maturity in the offender that I was um, hearing his throne here at, up here before me. This morning, I see a person, I think, it's fully rehabilitated, good program, um, positive remarks from the warden. Say if you're the first one to line up uh, for uh, volunteer work. And I listened intensively this morning, and I heard a mature individual who recognized what he did at the age of 16 was wrong. I asked you a question and you answered me honestly. Because I see this full rehabilitation, I see this maturity, I have positive remarks from Ward Ambrose, excellent transition plan, starting with the Louisiana Parole Project and with your daughter, good program, in the age in which you committed this crime, you were 16. You were very uh, attuned to wanting to be loved. And you wanted to have some companionship. And you probably didn't get it at home, so you were with your friend based on Everything that I just mentioned, my vote is to grant your early release with the following condition. A curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. I want you to do some community service with at-risk youth. You were 16 when you commit this crime. If you follow what's happening today, youth with guns and murdered every other day, I want you to get with your parole officer or your pastor, and I want you to talk to disadvantage you and try to steer them in the right direction. And I also want you to attend NAAA meeting at the direction of your parole officer. Good luck. All right, Mr. Mingo. Um, you've been, you've done some really, really good programming, I see. Uh, you started working probably before you knew you were going to have a parole eligibility day. Um, I, I do. Uh, See in the record the the, the, uh, the impact that our uh, the victims are still experiencing um, the victims' family. Um, you know, I think I think you're on the right track. I just don't think it's today for me. Uh, in deference to the victim and the opposition that's been expressed, my vote today is is to deny your parole. I, I will encourage you. As Mr. Freeman has reapplied, we are eligible to do so and stay on the stay on the right track. Thank you. 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 Thank you
for that view. So you got two uh, votes to deny, one vote that was favorable to the outcome of those proceedings that you correctly denied. So good luck. Thank you. Okay, so let's unpack this. I might surprise you. Uh, I actually thought he should have gotten paroled. I disagree with Miss Renasa and Mr. Freeman I, I, on the grounds that if really if anyone would get parole, wouldn't it be someone who's been locked up for 27 and a half years and committed a crime when he was 16? And it's just not as brutal of crimes that we have heard and seen on parole hearings for people who have served less time who have who have had the the actual victims there at the parole hearing pleading with the board not to release them and yet the board would commute their sentence and it's just the discrepancy I'm, I'm quite confused by that and you know and and i think to validate some of my feelings is mr roche being the one to say i think you should you should be paroled now i i want to commend the ada really i i, I do because it's adas like him and i i'm, I'm want, guessing he must have retired we haven't seen him ever this is the first time I, I guess i could have googled him but i didn't and he, he drove two hours to speak on behalf of victims that he hasn't even spoken to they're unable the pro board's unable to get in touch with them he drove two hours. Oh, I know it's his mistake. He could have just gotten on a Zoom call. It's, you know, but don't worry. Taxpayer dollars paid for that mistake. But the, but to, 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 to do it just because he felt it was right. And that's, that is, uh, that is just rare. You just don't see that. And he was doing it, you know, his, the father who had to pull his son and, and be involved in that, but his, and his father, and, and, and maybe, you know, his father passed away from maybe a broken heart shortly after just what he said. But, um, I commend the ADA for, for doing, for doing that, but I don't agree with them keeping him locked up. It seems that he's, you know, that. Yes, the crime that he described was different than the ADA, but not not to the the, the, the tremendous degree. Um, also, we will go over the court transcript. There are some interesting things in particular about this case that could be mitigating factors. Uh, his jury verdict was was a 10 to 2. There were two jurors that did not think he was guilty of this crime. Maybe they thought he was guilty of manslaughter. This was gang violence. He, he His story um, is different than the story that the ADA said, or that's in the record that the ADA says we don't have it, where it does seem that he assassinated a rival member. Um, but also, again, remember that it was one shot. It wasn't he emptied a magazine like we've seen. It was one shot. He ran and he was 16. And he served 27 and a half years. So I, my point is, is that if, if anyone out of all the hearings that we've seen should get released, I think he comes on the top of the list. So there's not a lot in here about the crime that will give us any insight to it, but there are some interesting things. One is that this was an appeal that was decided on June 14, 2021, judgment rendered. This hearing was June 15, 2022. Oh, oh, for a second, I thought it was it was a day after. So it was a year and a day after. So, you know, he's trying everything. And 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 what the appeal really kind of states is he has he's a, a lot of he has several valid legal 
arguments. One is that he was 16. And well, that argument he won already. So the so uh, it's unconstitutional to lock a 16 year old for life without the eligibility of parole. So that's why he has parole eligibility. Um, but then also here it is second degree by a 10 to two verdict. And they found that to be illegal. Um, and and it, some are getting new 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 trials. Some aren't. It's it's hard to understand why. Um, but the trial was uh, the trial court granted the defendant an out of time appeal on June 9, twenty twenty. Now the defendant contends that since the jury verdict was invalid and since his conviction was re re resentencing or not final at the R Ramos versus Louisiana five ninety was decided his conviction sentence must be set aside. According to the defendant, to invalid verdict makes the sentence itself invalid. So he's arguing that I, I, it's, I shouldn't be found guilty. I should, you know, so how can I be serving a sentence uh, if, if, if the guilty verdict is in itself invalid? Um and they give the reference and held that the right to a jury trial under the Sixth Amendment in the United States Constitution incorporated against the states by the way of the 14th Amendment in the United States Constitution requires a unanimous verdict to convict defendant of serious offense. Isn't it interesting <laughs> that you had states, there were two states that, that were the final two states in the U.S. that did not uphold by the Sixth Amendment, and that was Louisiana, and I forget the other one, and we just went through it. No, it's a Google search away, but the Ramos court, it's not a state you would think. The Ramos court further noted that its ruling applied to those defendants convicted of felonies by non-unanimous verdicts, whose cases are still pending under direct appeal. Census of firm on appeal in 1997, the defendant was a juvenile when he was committed uh, this crime, which he convicted and thus um, Miller and Montgomery, he was granted a new sentencing hearing and was resentenced to life with parole. So that's why he has parole. Now, following his resentencing, the defendant appealed his conviction by a non-unanimous jury verdict. The defendant's appeal was decided by the Fifth Circuit three months before Ramos was handed down. Oh, that's crazy. He, <laughs> can you imagine? I mean, I only feel more, you know, he handled this parole like a champ <laughs> in terms of the rejection. And uh, I have a lot of respect for boxers. I think it's really cool. He said it helped save his life. And maybe some of that's helped him in, in that chair. But he was off by three months. If he had waited three months to file his appeal. The Fifth Circuit found that although Brown was represented pursuant to Miller and legitimately exercised his rights to appeal that sentencing, that his resentencing did not allow him the opportunity of challenging his previously affirmed convictions. And I don't understand how that, that makes any legal sense. Brown then filed a writ of, oof, this one's going to be a certain. Terrari. I know a few of you might correct me in the comment section, and I will appreciate it. Seeking review of the Fifth Circuit's decision by Louisiana Supreme Court, which denied the writ application. Chief Justin Johnson concurred in the denial, finding that the defendant was entitled to an appeal of his new sentence, but not underlying conviction. Um... You know, it's interesting how they make that decision, but okay. Chief Justice Johnson concurred in the denial of the defendant's writ application despite his conviction by a non-unanimous jury verdict in that case, finding after Brown was represented pursuant to Miller and Montgomery, he was entitled to an appeal as a new sentence, not the underlying conviction. So they're basically saying, he's saying, you can get an appeal on your sentence, but not the conviction itself. Similarly, in the instant matter, the defendant's conviction affirmed in 98 became final long before Ramos' decision. Accordingly, we find, I don't understand how that's an argument. Well, it, it was affirmed in 98 before the decision. So the, the, the decision should be retroactive because it's illegal according to the Constitution of the United States, right? Am I alone here? We find that while the defendant was entitled to appeal his new sentence under Miller, he's not entitled to appeal his conviction. Why are we keep... Um, 
That's it. Appeals new sentence. Miller, he's not entitled to appeals conviction pursuant to Ramos, wherein Ramos court specifically found that its ruling applied to those defendants convicted of felonies of non-unanimous verdicts who cases are still pending on direct appeal. And again, it's like saying only if you have a, and we've seen this before, it's like only if you have appeals left or if you have pending appeals can you come back and say that your sentence was illegal. And I don't understand that. If, there, if the Supreme Court finds that it's illegal, according to the Constitution, to sentence someone for a severe sentence by a non-unanimous jury, then how can you have people locked up by what the Supreme Court has, is, has ruled illegal? As you know, I am far from being uh, even... Um, far from being even, uh, I would say even knowledgeable in law, I'm more just like, uh, it's just, I find it interesting. And I see a lot of cases and read a lot of this stuff. Maybe this is an argument that a lot of people have. Maybe it's a debate that is ongoing, but love to hear from those of you who are familiar with this and reading this. The United States Supreme Court held that Miller's decision announced a new subs substantiative con constitutional role that was retroactive on state collateral review. I don't know. But his sentence was affirmed. Anyways, I, we probably will see him sometime soon. Uh, and when we do, we'll, we'll replay the hearing. And for those of you who completely disagree with me and think you should be locked up forever, you let me know. With that, I'll let you go.